Welcome to the Non-Beta Alpha Podcast, your source for unique insights into current market trends, with host Ryan Morfin, CEO of Wentworth Management Services. Today, we're talking with Anthony Scaramucci, American financier and founder of Skybridge Capital. We're talking all about Bitcoin, the Reddit short squeeze, and of course, a little hint of policy and politics. This show is brought to you by Status Jet. Elevate your status. Anthony, welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, great to be here, Ryan. I'm a huge fan of everything you do. Well, thank you, Anthony. And the same goes for Skybridge and yourself. So, you know, we're here to talk today a little bit about your your new fund. Uh, it's a Bitcoin fund, and Bitcoin has been uh, to every, getting everyone's attention. Would love to hear a little bit about why Skybridge decided to go down this path and what your view is of Bitcoin as an asset class. So. Listen, when I first got to Bitcoin, I was a Bitcoin skeptic. I'm going to take you back to 2014. And the Winklevoss brothers came to the SALT conference and laid out the case for Bitcoin, Ryan. And I said to them, OK, I understand why you believe what you believe. But a lot of things have to happen because I'm an institutionalist. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, we've got $9 billion under management. We manage money for institutions and for high net worth individuals with an institutional process. And so what I said to the Winklevoss is, you'd need a few things to happen to convince me that you actually have a robust monetary network. And so we've had everything in technology change our lives and in many cases make our lives better. You know, you went from the horse to the horseless carriage and then you got to the airplane and now you've got this uh, phone. Imagine the phones that our parents or grandparents were using and look at this phone today. Uh, and so everything is changing. Technology is being, making things better, even the resolution on our computer screens. Uh, but what about money? Is, is it going to make money better? And after several failed attempts at creating a digital currency, there was DigiCash and others, uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, the person or the group that created the cryptology around Bitcoin, open sourcing it, limiting it to 21 million coins, uh, it seems to be the perfect sauce in that realm. And now I'm going to provide you evidence. Uh, what I said to the Winklevosses seven years ago, if it scales what you're doing, uh, your vision will be realized. Secondarily, and also importantly, if the government start taking it seriously and they start regulating it or taxing it, uh, then your vision is going to be realized. And then the third thing, uh, and this is particularly important for institutions, it has to be stored in a really safe way, Ryan. And so with the introduction of storage facilities like Fidelity Digital Assets, places like NIDIG that are operating in cold storage, uh, in Fidelity's case, they're cold storage off the internet, but they're also putting a layer of insurance protection on it. Uh, those things all of a sudden start to make this thing a reality. And I'll leave you with this one last thought. If Google is a search and ad network and Facebook is a social network and Amazon became, at least on the internet, the largest retail network, uh, I think Bitcoin has proven itself. 140 million plus users, a six, seven hundred million dollars, a billion dollars of market capitalization it has proven itself to be this very robust monetary network. And you and I know, because we study money for a living, what is money? It's effectively a ledger. It's an acceptable ledger between human beings. And Bitcoin has become that. And as it scales, I think those coins are going to become very, very valuable in the global marketplace. And, and so as gold has been the historical dollar hedge, uh, are you seeing institutional and retail investors start to move more towards accepting Bitcoin as a dollar hedge? Yeah, well, listen, I think gold is the big kahuna. You've got $12 trillion of market capitalization in gold. It has 5,500 years of history. And so I would say that is the a priori number one hedge. Are there incrementalists moving into Bitcoin? There are, uh, but let's, let's state the facts to your viewers and listeners. Bitcoin is at a less than currently 1% adoption. And so if gold is uniformly adopted and Bitcoin's at 1% adoption, and I can prove to you that Bitcoin might be better at being gold than gold is at being gold in terms of its impenetrability, it's impossible to steal, it has, uh, it's easy to port 
uh, to to move around. It has great portability, all of these different things. And and if you're just accepting that that encryption is an asset and there's a liability in an asset, well then we've got then we've got digital gold. In the case of gold, sometimes I get pushed back. People say, well, gold it's a hard asset and you you know, you can melt it and you can make it into jewelry and all this other stuff. And I will tell you that that's not really um, 100% true in the sense that if you just took the medicinal and manufacturing purposes of gold, uh, it would trade at a fraction of what it's trading at in the marketplace. So, so I'm just trying to put things into context for people. We are seeing institutions grab a hold of this. We are seeing treasurers and CFOs at corporations like MicroStrategy grab a hold of this, but it's very, very, very early. And if we can just get to a five or six percent saturation rate, I think these coins could trade two, three, four hundred thousand dollars a coin. Uh, think about where they are right now at 35 or 33,000 uh, with a one percent saturation rate. And you brought up a lot in your intro. Uh, one of the areas I wanted to talk to you about is, you know, how do you look at the regulatory environment for Bitcoins? Uh, it's a very nascent, you know, regulatory regime. Uh, what needs to be done? What needs to be kind of further thought out? And, um, you know, where are we in that timeline? Well, I think the good news for America is Gary Gensler uh, taking the SEC post. I think it's very positive for uh, crypto. Uh, Gary uh, taught a course at MIT on cryptocurrencies. It's available online. You could just Google it. It's a 24 hour, le it's one lesson, you know, 24 one hour lessons. It's a great course. Uh, I made all of the people at Skybridge uh, listen in on that. And Gary really has a good understanding of what's going on in the crypto space. And so I predict uh, we already have it on our IRS forms. It's already taxable. They're treating it as an asset, which is favorable to Bitcoin. But I do predict over time, the SEC will get comfortable with this. One of these Bitcoin ETF applications will eventually be accepted. They were rejected in 2008, but I think they will likely be accepted over the next 12 to 24 months. Uh, I think you'll see a Bitcoin mutual fund as well. Uh, and so I'm trying to get my clients conditioned for this. And since they can't get into those things right now, we've tried to create the best mousetrap available pursuant to what's going on in the regulatory rubric in the United States. So our fund has a 90 day lockup with 60 days notice. It's at 75 basis points uh, and it has daily entry. You could go to a grayscale, uh, but grayscale is typically trading anywhere from a 15 to a 30% premium on the pink sheets itself. Uh, and you've got a 2% management fee with Grayscale. Now you do get the benefit of being able to trade in and out of it, but I would recommend to individual investors, don't do that with Bitcoin. If anything, buy and hold the Bitcoin for a period of time. Uh, don't catch yourself in that speculative frenzy. Uh, you and I are old enough and long enough in our industry to know that the speculative frenzies end in tears for a lot of people. So my, my best advice to people is buy and hold, own a piece of Bitcoin that you're comfortable with, recognizing its itinerant volatility, uh, but also recognize that if we're right and if our vision is right, this thing ends up uh, trading to the market capitalization of gold. And if we're wrong, it could probably trade to at least half of the market capitalization of gold. And what is the appropriate mindset for a hold period for an investor uh, with a Bitcoin fund like this? Well, again, we, 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 we gave the shortest duration possible mm -hmm. uh, 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 without being accused by the IRS of trading a limited partnership, which is a no-no in the United States. And I think what we're delivering to investors is the NAV of the coin. So if you go to some other vendors, uh, you're buying the coin. If you go to Coinbase, you're, you're paying very high commissions there. If you're buying it through us, it's low commissions because we're you know, we're either doing the trade at Fidelity or through an institutional broker of Bitcoin. Uh, and so, and then you have our cold storage capability, which I think is second to none, uh, but then you're also getting the NAV of the coin. Uh, so my holding period, I'm recommending people have a two to three year holding period. Think of these things like equities. Think of this as a maturing monetary network that is scaling. And I'll point out to people that Amazon, when it was a maturing 
retail network that was sc scaling, uh, it dropped 50% six times uh, since its inception, since its IPO. And so that volatility, what, what's driving the volatility? Um, I don't understand the, I guess what I would call the fundamentals that drive kind of the trading range of, of Bitcoin. How, how, do, how do you look at that? So the fundamental, well, listen, it's, it's trading on three or four different qualifications, but the number one thing that I look at, and I think it is the most indicative of its value is the number of users on the monetary network. And so if you just look at Bitcoin as the number of people in the world own the coins, uh, the price is scaling upward. Now, it's a new technology still. It's still in its early adoption phase, so it will have volatility to it. So if you're trading Bitcoin, then I have to recommend that you have to look at it the way a chartist would look at it. And you have to use technical analysis associated with that in terms of understanding where psychological uh, tops are or psychological bottoms, what the, the weighted average is on a daily basis in terms of a, a 200 day moving average. Uh, but I would recommend not doing that. If you're looking at it fundamentally, uh, then I would take it, I take a look at it from a store of value perspective. Uh, and that's really how I'm looking at it. And I'm, I'm simply saying if this becomes acceptable to people as a store of value, and I predicted it will, and it can do a half as well as gold and we could have four or five trillion dollars of market capitalization around Bitcoin, uh, then you have a very successful investment, but then you also have for yourselves and your family a store of value. Remember in the United States right now, uh, the dollar traditionally has been considered a store of value. And for a hundred years plus, it's been the reserve currency of the world. But yet in the last six months, Ryan, we produced 23.2% more dollars. And so when you look at it from that perspective, you look at the money supply, if you've got dollars in your account, either in your account, in your RA, or let's say it's in your bank account, and somebody just told you, well, we just produced 23.2% more of those, what do you think is going to happen? Well, the things you want to buy with those dollars, whether it's Hamptons Real Estate, it's Turtle Creek Mansions in uh, Dallas, or you pick the, pick the spot in the world, or you pick the collectible, or whatever it is that you want to buy, uh, those things are going to go up on a nominal basis in terms of the number of dollars that you're going to need to use. What I love about Bitcoin is Bitcoin is uh, a fixed supply. You're held to the 21 million coins. Perhaps two and a half to three and a half million coins have disappeared through lack of successful storage in the inception of Bitcoin, there's about 2 million or so coins left to be mined. And so what, what, one of the most interesting things about this situation is anytime that you have more demand for something, more supply is created. Just think of oil. Uh, if you're going to price oil at $200 a barrel, they're going to start drilling it everywhere all over the world. You start fracking it. You start putting uh, offshore rigs. You know, you get the picture. Everything, you know, Tesla stock, more Tesla stocks created. But in Bitcoin, no more supply can be created. And if you really understand human psychology and value and scarcity, uh, I think you've got a, a real winner with Bitcoin. You know, one last point, I think you'll get a kick out of this. About two weeks ago, uh, the Mickey Mantle card, I'm reading a great biography of Mickey uh, by Jane Levy. It was written about 10 years ago. It was called The Last Boy. Uh, but but and, and I was inspired to start reading it two weeks ago because his baseball card from 1956 uh, just traded for $5.2 million. So I just want everybody to stop and think about that. That is a cardboard piece of paper, a cardboard, if you will, that was cut <laughs> in 1955 and it was printed with four color process print on both sides. Uh, and you can own it in a lucite block for $5.2 million. And you say, okay, well, that's worthless. Why would I own that? Uh, yet you and I know in the world of memorabilia and the iconic status that Mickey Mantle held in the American uh, zeitgeist. Uh, he was an American icon of the mid-century America, the post-World War II America. And all of a sudden this piece of memorabilia becomes quite valuable and its scarcity will likely lead it to trade up to a higher price. I bought the Mike Piazza jersey from the 9-11 uh, uh, home run, the, the first sporting event after 9-11. 
We paid three hundred and sixty thousand dollars for that jersey. That jersey is probably worth two million dollars today. Uh, the good news for everybody, it is ensconced safely at the 9/11 Museum. We we put it there. But my point being is, when you have something scarce, uh, uh, people will gravitate to it and people will pay for it. Think of what goes on in the art world, as an example. Yep. No. No. No doubt. And you know, I, I think the the psychology around you know the, we'll call it the consumer sentiment around you know the increased debt levels you know the the questioning of the reserve currency status um what are your thoughts on you know how that's driving institutional investors into the 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 bitcoin space well i think i think the institutional investors again i want to be very upfront with everybody the institutional investors are exceedingly cautious i would encourage people to read ray dalio's uh, 17 or 18 page white paper on his analysis of Bitcoin. Uh, he, he ends that paper by, by and large positive, but still extremely cautious. And so, so it is happening, um, but it's happening very, very slowly. But I think what does happen is the reinforcement of that network. So if that network continues to scale, if you and I are sitting here a year from now, hopefully we'll be out of the pandemic, Ryan, uh, but maybe we'll be together face to face, but if we're sitting here a year from now and there are 280 million coin holders versus 140, then I can tell you the price of these coins are going to be way higher uh, and it will give institutions weirdly uh, a reason to find them more acceptable. I know this sounds weird to people, but at $400 a coin in 2014, when I was introduced to the idea of Bitcoin, I'm more comfortable with Bitcoin at $30,000 than I am there. Bitcoin has slayed 6,500 competitors since its inception 12 years ago. Bitcoin has become the standard in cryptocurrency. Bitcoin to me has become, if you're, if you're accepting digitization and the idea of a digital store of value, uh, Bitcoin has become the monster on the block. I think it's become an irreplaceable asset in that, in that realm. And so, and so for those reasons, I do think these institutions will accept it. You, you know, and I know that uh, BlackRock just gave the green light for its largest fixed income funds to own Bitcoin and to own Bitcoin futures. And I think that's going to start to happen. Uh, and obviously, you know, Elon Musk, uh, somewhat cryptic, but he's... Uh, putting Bitcoin in his profile page on Twitter, and he's suggesting that inevitably this was going to happen. And, uh, you know, I don't know if he's in, in it or not, but the idea that corporations would hold some Bitcoin on their balance sheet at a time when we know there's going to be heavy production in U.S. dollars. We did 23% more increase in supply over the last six months. We're likely to do even more of those in the coming year or two as a result of what's going on in the pandemic and, and the government using monetary stimulus and monetary policy to try to smooth things over. In some of the, the more, I'll call assertive uh, institutional investors, what kind of allocation, if they're an asset allocator, what kind of allocation are they gonna to start to push into digital assets? So I've been telling people uh, one to 3%. Uh, institutions, my guess is if they get comfortable, they'll probably start thinking of it like gold. And you know, most institutions, depending on their asset allocation matrix and what their targeted goals are, are somewhere between zero and 8% with gold, uh, maybe zero to 10% at certain times in, in the cycle. Uh, but I, I, I'm not suggesting Bitcoin, like there are people that you're gonna meet that are called Bitcoin maximalists. And you say, what's your net worth? It's a dollar. Uh, okay, how much do you have in Bitcoin? 100% of it. Okay, you're like, okay, whoa. You know, I'm telling my clients or, or RIAs, you know, wealthy individuals, don't miss this frontier. Um, put a percent, uh, put a one and a half percent exposure into Bitcoin. Don't miss this frontier. Maybe you missed Google, maybe you missed Facebook, maybe you didn't get a full understanding of what was going on in Amazon throughout the years. But you have something happening right before your eyes that I think is going to transform the investment landscape and transform the concepts of the store of value. And so a half a percent to a one and a half percent exposure uh, will likely make sure that you don't miss a meal. But if we're right and it moves 10 to one or seven to one, 
uh, you'll be very happy that you joined us uh, uh, as we watch this unfold. Well, shifting gears a little bit, because um, I do think it, it goes back to the, the thesis of the fund. Um, what are your views on where we are today from a, you know, a fiscal and monetary policy, um, given that we've been you know, going through a, a once in a hundred year event, uh, modern monetary theories continuing to stimulate the economies globally, all the central bankers are you know, correlated in their actions. How do you see this playing out? And is this another huge demand driver for people to start really taking Bitcoin a lot more serious? So, I mean, I think that the last financial crisis was the precursor for Bitcoin. And I think the, uh, the originators of Bitcoin were basically saying, if you read the white paper, that we have to be very, very careful in a fiat currency world. If we're going to use the fiat currency and some of our central bankers have said that we have an infinite supply of dollars, that is of course true. We do have an infinite supply of dollars, but, but if you start to think about it that way, what ends up happening is you ruin the uh, uh, the integrity of that dollar. You ruin that dollar as a symbol or a store of value. And let me just point this out to people. We unclipped the dollar from the gold standard in August of 1971. The one ounce of gold, uh, it cost 35 US dollars to buy one ounce of gold uh, roughly 50 years ago. Today, you know, and, spot price of gold, let's just use 2000, it's moving, but let's say it's 2000 right at this moment. So I just want you to stop and think about that. We have monetized our debt. We have devalued our dollar by 98%. So that means your purchasing power on a hundred dollar bill today is equivalent to $2 in 1970. I just want you to stop and think about that. And so if that's not worrying high net worth individuals or that's not worrying uh, people that have assets, it should worry them. And now you're being told we have $28 trillion of debt. Uh, the impossibility of paying that debt off through taxation uh, is glaringly obvious. You're not gonna be able to do that. Uh, will you be able to monetize it and weaken the dollar and print more dollars and pay the debt off with dollars that are worth less than the ones that you borrowed? Yes. And so if you're an investor, you have to seek other stores of assets. And so of course you want hard assets, real estate's less liquid, art is less liquid, uh, but something like Bitcoin is incredibly robustly liquid. And I think it has to be part of your portfolio. And it's way easier to store, of course, uh, than a gold bullion. Well, that's, that's absolutely right. So in, as a reserve currency status, uh, are you as an American business owner, are you at all worried that the, the Chinese currency is going to, in the future, take more of that market share, Bitcoin, take more of that market share. H how do you balance um, those other competing forces? Well, the banking system is set around the world to the US dollar. And, and there are two factors, I think, historically, from a geopolitical point of view, that have influenced which currency ultimately becomes the world's reserve currency. Uh, the United States took this over from the British pound. And we've had a 100-year dollar supremacy. But I think the two factors, Ryan, are military might. And there, we have the largest military second to none on planet Earth. And then the second factor is that the denomination of the most important commodity, oil, is in US dollars. And that got done by Franklin Roosevelt and the founder of Saudi Arabia, Ibn Saud, 80 or so years ago, they signed a peace treaty or a contract where we would help protect oil tankers coming out of the Arabian or Persian Gulf. And a result of which they would peg their prices to the US dollar. I don't see that changing anytime soon. Moreover, uh, despite our current political drama in the US, uh, the world still sees our capitalist system and our free market system as sound. The world also sees our legal system and the precedents there as sort of the common law precedents as, uh, let's just put it this way, I think that those things are sanctified around the world. I think that until a country like China, despite its economic prowess and despite all of its economic growth and the miracle of China's prosperity, until they can have a more diffuse system and a more decentralized system that won't be at the capricious whims of certain people at the top of the food chain. 
Uh, just look at what happened to Jack Ma and Alibaba as an example. You know, the Chinese have made a decision. They want to control Alibaba. And if that means that Alibaba has to be a second rate global enterprise, they're okay with it. And so if they're going to continue to practice governmental policy in that capricious manner, I don't see how their currency can be treated with the same level of supremacy that the US dollar currently is. So I think the US dollar stays in its position for many, many years to come. Uh, but that's not to say that there won't be a portfolio of things to consider, some gold, perhaps some Bitcoin, perhaps other currencies uh, as we continue to evolve the global economy. No, that's that's a, a very interesting thought. I mean, the Jack Ma story is pretty uh, interesting to watch. And uh, yeah, I, I tend to agree with your, your thoughts on that. Um, so one question for you is, you know, there's been a lot of activity this week in the hedge fund community. You're the father of democratization for hedge funds for the retail market. Um, what was your take on that GameStop fiasco, micro bubble, whatever you want to call it? Love to hear your take on what happened. Um, so it is the classic bee swarm activity born from low interest rates and free money. And so I saw that in biotechs in 1991. We saw it in the dot-com bubble in the late 90s. And we're seeing it today off of the Reddit bulletin board. Two things have changed. Uh, the first thing that's changed is this phone that I have in my hand uh, has more computing power than we put the Apollo 11 astronauts on the moon. And so I can sit at a traffic light now and wait for the light to change green. And I have all of the power of a 1995 Goldman Sachs prop trader. I have unlimited information in real time and I have costless trading. So just think about the decentralization, democratization of capitalism or of the marketplace. This particular instrument combined with an E-Trade or a Robinhood is putting everybody in a catbird seat. And so when you see something anomalous, uh, it's clearly anomalous and should not have been allowed to happen, frankly, where you have 140% short interest in GameStop. So, so Ryan, you got you, you know, you and I have been around this industry a long period of time. If, if there's 140% short interest in GameStop, it now becomes impossible from a theoretical perspective to cover that short. You can only buy 100% of the float. So how are you going to cover the short? Right? It has to be some level of recirculation. And so when Reddit posted that, it became an arbitrage opportunity or an opportunistic opportunity for this mass bee swarm of individual traders. Two things were happening at the same time. The standard operating procedure for shorts that know they're right on fundamentals is to hang tough, okay? But now, now you're going up against tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of micro traders. Okay, so now you gotta start to adapt yourself to that new reality. Second thing that was going on, and I think this was really unfair to Robinhood, is if I'm buying the stock on margin, let's say I know I'm in Robinhood's risk department and I know that GameStop's worth $20. It's fundamentally inferior. It's trading in the marketplace at 50 and there's short interest piling up. If it's trading to 300 and I know that it's worth 20 and I've got my account holders wanting me to give them margin to buy the stock at 300. So let's say they have $150 in their margin account and they want me to lend them $150. But Ryan, I know the stock's worth 20. If that stock goes from 300 to 20, which could happen, and I predict this stuff ends in tears, uh, I've destroyed Robinhood. I've destroyed, I've been wiped out by these micro traders that are investing in trading on heavy margin. Now, he didn't want to say that to Andrew R. Sorkin last week or to Chris Cuomo because he doesn't want to further inflame these smaller investors. Secondarily, then the follow-up question should be, well, why don't you just let the people that are trading on your platform in cash buy GameStop? Let them go crazy with their own money. And his answer to that is another simplistic answer, which would get him in trouble, uh, is that, well, on, on the phone, if I decide that I want to have a margin account at Robinhood, I can press five or six buttons, you get a hold of my credit score, and Robinhood clears me, and in two seconds, I'm out there trading with their margin. That's why he had to put a blanket stop 
on all those stocks. I really believe him that Citadel didn't tell him to put the stop on it or big hedge funds didn't tell him or the SEC. He was trying to preserve the financial integrity of Robinhood in this feeding frenzy. So uh, I, I wanna just caution people, uh, this sort of stuff ends in tears. You're way better off taking Ryan's advice and investing in his IRA and having this super balanced portfolio uh, and staying the course and staying disciplined than getting caught up in these feeding frenzies. Yeah, and I, I think another, for a lot of these broker dealers that decided to you know pause trading for this, um, it's the DVP risk of a broken trade because you know I could only imagine the regulatory backlash uh, for a lot of retail investors trying to buy this and. You know the trades broke, and you know they don't think about what happens when you can't you know execute a trade, and when you have this feeding frenzy uh, that happens. So I think there was a lot of firms that ended up pumping the brakes on this to to try to make sure they understood what was going on. Just Robin, and I think they got in the most trouble. I think they got in the in the crosshairs of Stoll Presidente because of their mission statement of really trying to help a smaller investor, but they couldn't put their company at risk in that effort. And by the way. I'm not telling people what to buy. You want to buy GameStop at 500. It's your money. By all means, you should be able to buy GameStop at 500. But I'm, I'm 33 years in this business, less my 11-day fiasco in the White House, of course. Uh, but I would tell you to be careful. I would tell you to the Get Rich Slow program is the only one that really works. <laughs> totally agree. Totally agree. So the hedge fund community, as we're starting to see, you know, you know, more active trading going on, um, how, how is that hedge fund marketplace looking going forward? What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think the hedge fund community, once again, is making this big adaptation. Obviously, uh, some of the community, myself included, got slammed in the COVID-19 crisis of March of 2020. We've had a very significant recovery in our core funds. We're up over 33% from April 1st in our core funds. And I think what's happened is the hedge fund community, Skybridge Capital, myself, we've all made an adaptation to the new reality. We're in a uh, COVID world. We're never going back to a pre-COVID world. We're going to enter a post-COVID world or a, a world that has some COVID but is on the other side of the lockdowns associated with a pandemic. And I think we have to think about the world the way it is, not the way we want it to be. And so if hedge funds now have to think about the world where there's going to be these micro investors that be swarm their short positions, well, guess what they're going to do? They're going to have less short positions or they're going to have a more diversified short book or they're going to have stops in their short portfolio to prevent what's called gamma risk. What is gamma risk? It's a really fancy way of saying that crazy bonkers stuff happens that's totally irrational and totally unpredictable in the market. If you've got something that's intrinsically worth $20, it's trading at 50, that's somewhat rational because there's always some level of exuberance in the market. But if it's going to 500, that's full on gamma. And I think these hedge funds are now going to make that adaptation. And frankly, um, I, uh, my money's on these hedge funds. They're a very smart group of people. Yeah, no, no doubt. And I, I do think active management's coming as more volatility appears like this with you know higher liquidity globally. Active management is going to be definitely a, a more interesting uh, place to, to place your cash. So the SALT conference, switching gears a little bit, um, you know, you guys have been doing this great series of SALT talks. Uh, SALT is a preeminent name in the conference space. What's your view in a post-COVID world? How is that going to reappear? Um, I, I, you know, I've got an announcement coming. I mean, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll steal the thunder of the announcement a little bit. We're, 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 we're just working on dates right now with the state of New York. Uh, we're probably going to put this in New York City in September. Obviously, we have to do it in a way where we know everybody's healthy and we have to have some level of COVID protocols. Hopefully, uh, the people that will be attending the conference by that time will be fully vaccinated. Um, but we'll certainly have safety be the a priori thing. Um, and so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful and optimistic about that. Of course, I want you there and I want you to speak there. No, we appreciate it. And we'll definitely be there. Um, you know, in this COVID environment that we're in and, you know, looking at the mutations coming out as a as a investor looking over the horizon, 
Um, are you worried at all about the, the vaccine mix that we have not being able to keep up with the mutation of the virus? Well, listen, I'm not the expert on that. I can, I would, I would have to rely on Dr. Fauci for that. And I think that if you, if you, if you read about the RNA technology associated with these vaccines, again, not to oversimplify it, but years ago, we would give you some of the disease. We would give you a little bit of the disease. Your body would get a little sick and then it would pr produce these antibodies and T cells to defeat the disease. And so that was sort of the polio vaccine or the early measles and certainly the, the, the Dr. Jenner smallpox vaccine in the 1700s. These new vaccines are almost like a blueprint for your body. And so what happens is they're in injecting this RNA sequence into the body and they're telling your body, we're not making you sick, but we want you to recognize what sickness looks like. And if sickness were to enter the body, this is the blueprint that you need to develop to create T cells and antibodies, okay, to defeat this vac to defeat this disease. And so the reason why that's very unique and it's historic, frankly, is that as you get these variants or you get these mutations, you can then alter or produce a vaccine cocktail to go up against those variants. And so I'm optimistic about those things. I will say, uh, that 50 years from now, someone will look back and say, we had a crisis. We had a, a pandemic that likely lasted like the Spanish flu pandemic two years. Uh, but in that pandemic, we did a moonshot on the vaccine process. And frankly, you know, I've tried to stay out of politics since the Trump administration ended, which is only, it's less than a Scaramucci since the Trump administration has ended. But, but I will say this, and I wanna be fair to the Trump administration, uh, Operation Warp Speed was a brilliant thing. Uh, the fact that President Trump and his team had the confidence to backstop those pharmaceutical companies and give them the necessary firepower of capital to develop these vaccines, I think are going to protect us longer term from future pandemics. Yeah, no, I think it's the, the shape-shifting of the mindset to accelerate the regulatory process and get, get medicine back into the population. Um, no, it's, it's going to be an interesting few years to see how we adapt to this post-COVID world. And I love your comment. It's, it's the way it is, not the way we want it to be. That's the truth. Um, question for you on SPACs. It, that it, happens to be the truth about my waistline too, Morphin. <laughs> it's all that eating from home. I know it's, it's very easy to make good pasta when you got extra time. Um, what's your thoughts on the SPAC market? I mean, it seems that everyone's raising a SPAC. It seems a little bit, from my perspective, I'm cautious because you know, you're basically going public without, you know, a lot of you know, underwriter, you know, liability or a lot of due diligence on the target. Is, is it an arbitrage opportunity to hold cash for hedge funds? Or is this a new mechanism uh, to change IPOs in the future? Yeah, so I, I actually think it's both of those things. I think it is a new method because of this excessive regulation that we have on publicly traded companies. This is an easier way for a private company to backdoor itself. Somebody did all the legwork, somebody did all the regulatory legwork, and now you can backdoor your private company into the public markets. And it is a reservoir of cash, and it creates this optionality for hedge fund managers and other people that like the SPAC market because they can vote against these SPACs if they don't like what the acquisition target is, or they can vote for them and they can add shares and get warrants. They can, they can participate in loans associated with these deals. And so listen, I think the SPAC market, unless we massively change the regulatory rubric around going public and the whole Dodd-Frank, as well as Sarbanes-Oxley treatments of a public company, I think the SPAC market is here to stay. Is it hot? Is it bubbly? You know, look, it feels hot and bubbly, but that doesn't mean that it's uh it's going away anytime soon. If anything, uh, you know, hot and bubbly can outlast uh, uh, rationality. We both know that. Yep. Yep. Well, in, in not really to go into politics, but go into policy, perhaps. Um, you were recently quoted as saying that you thought the Biden administration, this is a good time to look at raising taxes, given our deficit spending. Could you go into a little more context around that and, um, and what your thoughts are behind that? Well, 
Well, what I what I actually was saying, I don't. I, I mean, maybe I was misquoted there, Ryan, because I don't think they can raise taxes right at this moment, given the anemia in the economy. Economy is too sluggish for a tax increase. Having said that, I'm not a modern monetary theorist where you can just print unlimited amounts of money and have an unlimited amount of deficit for the United States. I think that will end also in tears. And so I think we're going to have to get a uh, tax policy in place uh, that is not austerity, God forbid, because we don't want to overly wound the economy, but we may have to put a corporate tax rates, they're talking about going from 21 to 28. Uh, companies made a lot of money at that level. 39.6 was too high, frankly. Uh, U.S. taxes going back up to the Clinton rates of 39.6, we were able to survive and make money there. Uh, but we need to probably have a little bit more fiscal discipline. Is that happening anytime soon? I predict it won't. Um, I'll go back to the Obama administration after the global financial crisis, even though they wanted to put in tax increases, they didn't, they didn't do it because of the anemia of the economy. And I'll just say one thing that is political. I find it very ironic that deficit hawk supposed Republicans spent $8 trillion on the tab in terms of deficit spending uh, during the Trump administration. And now they're back to whining about deficit spending but yet they don't want to do anything about it. And the only thing you can do about deficit spending is you can either print more money, which has, I think, catastrophic social consequences, or you can raise taxes on people that can afford to pay them. Those are your choices. Just remember, your viewers know this, but it's worth reemphasizing. Deficit spending is unfunded tax liability. Someone is eventually paying it. We're either paying it through an increase in taxes or we're paying it through the printing of money. It's one or the other. Do you think the deficit hawks are, uh, uh, what's the right way to put it, uh, not a political uh, powerhouse anymore? Meaning uh, it seems the Republicans and the Democrats both have one playbook, just throw money at it. And it, it seems that that policy is, doesn't have the political you know, might anymore to really get people to the ballot box. I, I think that I think we're in a new world when it comes to that as well. I think that we've uh, we've got free spenders on both sides, and and I. But I'm also in the camp that you probably need some free spending right now. You know, I'm I'm in the camp that this deficit spending that we're doing right now, I think, is necessary because you don't want to completely cripple our economy. You know, that's really what the government should be for. Let me frame it this way, Ryan. If a sovereign country last January invaded the United States with their army and they wounded, you tell me, 20 million people, how many people have gotten COVID in the US, okay? And they killed 400,000 people and 100,000 people a day or 150,000 people a day are being wounded by this army and 4,000 people a day of our fellow citizens are being shot and killed in the street by this army and murdered by this army. What would the governmental response be to that tragedy? And I think if you stop and you think about it that way, you can start to frame it in a way that we, we need to from a policy response perspective. And so that's, that's all I'm saying. Uh, that's a great analogy. And uh, yeah, I think at times of war, we saw what we did in World War II, right? We, we got debt levels of GDP up over 100. You had, to, you had to take the GDP level up. You knew you were fighting a scourge. When the scourge was over, you were you set up the backdrop of a real economic boom. Well, and I guess there's one political question, but I hope it's not uh, uh, too controversial. I'm happy to answer them. I'm just trying to focus on business because my partners yell at me. You know, they're like, "All right, Trump's no, old, no, no. Let's move on." You know, we, we won't even. We won't. I guess we'll, we'll kind of skip over Trump and just say, "What is the future?" Ask anything you want, Ryan. You and I know each other a long time. Oh, I appreciate it, Anthony. I, what is the future of the GOP? How do you see this playing out? Um, you got moderates, never Trumpers. You got the MAGA crew. Civil war coming inside the party. What are your thoughts? Well, look, you're at a fork in the road and you have the risk that the party splits into two pieces. I think that would be very bad for the party. I also think it'd be very bad for the country. And short term, it would be very good for the Democrats because they'll 
be placed in a position of power for probably a generation. You know, um, Donald Trump, like it or not, some of your viewers like him, other people don't like him, but let's just be observational for a moment. Uh, uh, as a result of his four-year term, he lost the presidency, he lost the House, and he lost the Senate. Now, someone said, well, the COVID-19, okay, it really doesn't matter. There was a Great Depression, and it pulled Herbert Hoover out of the uh, presidency, and you could blame Herbert Hoover for it or not, but I'm just saying the circumstances and the events that were taking place during his presidency caused a Herbert Hoover-like effect. They lost the House, the Senate, and the presidency. And so in Herbert Hoover's case, you had a 20 year run for the Democrats. And is that coming? Well, that might be coming, okay, if these guys don't get their house in order. Uh, if they get their house in order, <coughs> excuse me, and I mean unify the party and come up with the right party leadership and see if they can coexist in the same party without killing each other, uh, maybe you'll have a Reagan like situation where you had the impeached or potentially impeached President Richard Nixon. Uh, he leaves office. The Republican Party thinks they're going into a nuclear winter and they rise by 1980. You know, they're only out of office for four years, you know, and they back in office in 1980 and they have a 12 year run. So it's really going to be up to party leadership. I think Kevin McCarthy's making a mistake because what's required here is leadership and guidance. It's not what's not happening is leadership and guidance. And Kevin once said something to me. He talked about leadership being a thermostat or a thermometer. And he once said to me that we have too many thermometers in Washington where people are taking the temperature of the air. And if the air is hot, they speak with hotness. If it's cold, they speak with coldness. He said, but what we really need is a thermostat. You know, where you go over to it, you punch into it on your wall and you take the temperature to the location that it needs to, to benefit the American people. And he's not following his own advice because he's re overly reacting to Trump and Trumpism. And I believe that these people are angry and some of them will think it's justifiable anger, but I think it's anger born from failed economic policy and from by and large feeling economically desperate. When people are economically happy, they go to work and they shut up and they, uh, they grow their families and they live with great success. If they're unhappy, then they wanna have a revolution or they wanna storm a Capitol building or they wanna do things that are potentially destructive to the order uh, that they're existing in. And so we have to re-enfranchise these people. And if we don't re-enfranchise these people, I think we're making a, uh, a terrible mistake. You know, and this is a problem I'm having. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm in the fight every day because I'm a classical, conservative Republican. I tried to help Donald Trump, it didn't work out for me. I then explained to people why I thought he was a danger. Uh, but you've got, a, you've got a group of lefties that they'll never accept anybody that's ever supported Donald Trump. And that's not gonna work either. You know, we have to figure out a way to heal and unify the country, Ryan. I, I love that analogy. It's you need to, a leader needs to set the temperature, not take the temperature. That's a that's a great piece of advice, and uh, I think from Representative Kevin McCarthy. That, that's not my, well, that's, that, not my ori that's not original programming from me. That was him. <laughs> so one one question because I I've seen you really embrace the the role you've been able to play as commentator of just speaking truth to power, uh, getting on the media a lot. You've set up Mooch FM. What is your view on where the media goes? Because you know there's some distrust from the right. Um, you know there's new podcasts coming up. There's there's new channels of communication that are decentralized. What is the future of, of media and, and how do we get our news? So, you know, what I would what I would say to you is I'm disappointed in where the news is going because uh, we are less reliant on facts and we're more reliant on punditry. And so uh, that's hurting the society in some ways because we don't agree anymore on the facts. If I'm watching Fox, I hear the facts a certain way. You're watching MSNBC, you hear the facts a certain way. Now we got to debate the thing. We can't even agree on the facts. So the proliferation of news and the segmentation of news, which I thought was going to be by and large a good thing because it would add voices to the discourse has had the opposite effect. It has actually hurt us because it's, uh, 
it's putting us into silos, it's creating more tribalism. So, you know, I'm hoping and praying that that will reverse itself. I'm hoping that, uh, you know, I'm not saying we're gonna go back to the days of Walter Cronkite, the most trusted man in the news media, uh, but I'm hoping that we can get somewhere closer to a narrative in the news that has more objectivity in it than where we currently are. If it's not possible, then we're gonna need it from our political leadership. And what are your, what are your thoughts about podcasts and, you know, given some of the, the startups that are coming into the space, um, you know, do you, do you think that's going to put downward pressure on these, uh, these larger networks that have huge administrative burdens? Um, or do you, do you think this is more just a fad and, and as, as they start to figure out their editorial bias and, and get it reduced, they'll, uh, they'll bring the main street public back into, uh, believing them again? It's a really good question. I think, I think that the, uh, my short answer to this is that TV is the new TV. I know that sounds a little bit weird, but I mean, when TV was all the fanfare in the 1950s and 60s, and people were totally adjusted to appointment television, what's happening now is TV is morphing into a streaming service and an on-demand service, but for sporting events. And so what I have found is that this competition podcast that you're describing or you know stuff that's coming up over the net has actually made all of the programming better you know i could tell you i could go on hbo max there's fabulous programming i can go on uh uh disney plus and watch the mandalorian fabulous program hbo you've seen what they've done over the last 25 years fabulous programming and so I actually think that the competition is healthy and I think that you've got an increase consumption. Maybe the pandemic is even helping that uh, where we're consuming more of this stuff together. So I'm by and large bullish and by and large positive. I don't see the death of television. I think the reports of the death of television are greatly exaggerated. <laughs> so Andy, this is a, the last few questions they are usually more yes or no kind of questions. And if you want to add more context um, around them, but we ask all of our guests the same at the end. Um, 2021, is this a recession or a recovery? A recovery. Back half of 21, uh, what, you'll start to see the recovery. Yeah, I think there's a lot of spring-loaded growth too. Um, what's the best book that you've read lately? Well, the best book is actually behind me. This is probably my favorite book in uh, 2020. It's called Cast, and it was written by Isabel Wilkerson. So I put it, I put it behind me because I think it's a fascinating explanation of what's going on in the society and why we have such racial tension and you know how we have not really healed the original sin of slavery in our culture and i think everybody should read that book because i think it will enlighten them an investment book would be this one and this is uh, jeff bezos and somebody took he's never written a book but he this is his collective writings which is effectively many of his uh, investment letters and also his annual reports and it talks about things like the customer making decisions and so forth. And the best thing I can say about Jeff Bezos is he never geared Amazon towards that quarterly earning cycle. He was not trying to beat earnings. What he was trying to do was grow this magnificent network. And the weird thing is it ties back to Bitcoin in a weird way because Bitcoin has no CEO. Bitcoin is fully decentralized. And so for me, that is the future because you're talking about the decentralization of media, podcasting, radio shows, uh, television shows, streaming, et cetera. Uh, I do think that a decentralized monetary network uh, without the capricious, the caprice or the capriciousness of central bankers, I think it's, I think it's gonna be something people are gonna wanna look to. I think that they're gonna like that stability uh, where it can't be altered. And this is something that Jeff Bezos did for Amazon. So that's a book that I like a lot. Sorry to be long-winded on that one. No, 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 that's great. We, we love more recommendations, the better. Love hearing what people read. Um, next question is, uh, if you have access, would you take the vaccine, yes or no? Yes. And I guess the, the last uh, question is, you know, your outlook for 2021, what kind of goals are you excited about um, for yourself and your business? Well, for Skybridge, I want to scale our Bitcoin fund. I have a uh, $250 million asset target there. I think we can achieve that. We're at 70 now. 
So I don't think that that's overly ambitious, um, uh, particularly uh, I think we'll get a lot of that through appreciation in Bitcoin. Uh, for the Series G fund, uh, at a strong start to the year. January, we're up 2.5%. We're up 65 in December. As I pointed out, we're up 33% since April 1st of last year. I think we can have a 15 to 20% year, uh, just based on the distressed assets that we own coming off of the debacle of the pandemic. Um, and I think that uh, the firm is well positioned. You know, we're doing some secondary offerings, uh, pre-IPO offerings as well. Uh, we've got the SALT conference that uh, hopefully you'll be a speaker at coming in September. And so I'm pretty, I'm pretty optimistic about the, uh, the firm. And of course, I'm running for re-election in my marriage. And so I know that uh, people, <laughs> people, people that are out there married know what I'm talking about. I'm probably on like a one day term. And so I'm constantly campaigning there. <laughs> Who, who the hell knows? I may even have term limits there, but I'm doing the best I can there. And so I think 2021 will be a good year. And after 2020, we set the bar so low in 2020, Ryan, that I'm sure that we'll all feel that way. Fantastic. Anthony, thank you so much for your time and your thoughts and your leadership. And I hope to see you soon. Hey, great to be on with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This show is brought to you by Status Jet. Elevate your status. Fly anywhere, anytime, and experience the difference. Visit statusjet.com to charter your private jet today. Thanks for listening to this episode of Non-Beta Alpha. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram and Twitter and subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, and YouTube so you never miss a show. While you're at it, if you found value in this show, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes or simply share this episode with your friends. And now you know. Price references and market forecasts correspond to the date of this recording. This podcast should not be copied, distributed, published, or reproduced in whole or in part. The information contained in this podcast does not constitute research or recommendation from Non-Beta Alpha Inc., Wentworth Management Services, LLC, or any of their affiliates to the listener. Neither Non-Beta Alpha Inc., Wentworth Management Services, LLC, nor any of their affiliates make any representation or warranty as to the accuracy or completeness of the statements or any information contained in this podcast and any liability therefore including in respect of direct, indirect or consequential loss or damage is expressly disclaimed. The views expressed in this podcast are not necessarily those of Non-Beta Alpha Inc. or Wentworth Management Services LLC and Non-Beta Alpha Inc. and Wentworth Management Services LLC are not providing any financial, economic, legal, accounting or tax advice or recommendations in this podcast. In addition, the receipt of this podcast by any listener is not to be taken as constituting the giving of investment advice by Non-Beta Alpha Alpha Inc. or Wentworth Management Services LLC to that listener, nor to constitute such person a client of any affiliate of non-Beta Alpha Inc. or Wentworth Management Services LLC. This does not constitute an offer to buy or sell any security. Investments in security may not be suitable for all investors. An investment of any security may involve risk and the potential loss of your initial investment. Investors should review all risk factors before investing. Investors should perform their own due diligence before considering any investment. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Investment products, insurance and annuity products are not FDIC insured, not bank guaranteed, not insured by a federal government agency, may lose value.